Welcome to the Spiritual Ride Podcast. I'm your host, Alyssa LeBlanc, and I am so excited to have my friend and human design reader, Crystal Kohlberg, on the podcast today. How are you today? I'm good. How are you? I am so good. We actually just had a human design reading, and she shared so much with me, but let's talk about Crystal a little bit. She studied sports and performance psychology, studied human design, studies manifestation, is a 5-1 projector. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about your background. How did you get interested in human design and sports psychology? Okay, yeah. So I played sports my whole life growing up. And when I went to college, I was like, I don't know what I want to study. And like anyone else, I started with psychology. And then I moved into kinesiology, which is a study of human movement. So I kind of had this like psychology background and also sports background. And then I took a sports psychology class and was like, this is it. This combines all the things. And so I pursued sports psychology. I got my master's in uh, performance psychology and I'm almost finished with my doctorate in sport and performance psychology. And I just felt like something was missing. I'm like, there's all these cool parts of it where it's like we can help people with their confidence and their focus and goal setting. But it was very impersonal. It was like every single person should do this thing this way. And I'm like, I, it just didn't work for me. It just felt like it wasn't even, it wasn't even working for me in my personal life. I'm like, why would this work for my clients? And then I was super into like personality tests and I've been through all of them. And I found human design and was like, this is the one that feels the most like true to people, the most practical. And it just like, let me like hone in on people's, I guess, unique ways of doing things instead of giving them this like generalized advice. I completely agree. I feel like human design gives you permission to be yourself. 100%. So before meeting you, I did not know what sports psychology, performance psychology was. Can you <laughs> give us like a brief definition for those that don't know? Yeah. So it's, it's basically the mental aspects of performance. It's like, how can you use your mind to perform better or to get out of your own way? So things like goal setting and communication and motivation and relaxation. So like if you're getting, um, you know, if you're over aroused or under aroused during performance or you're not communicating with your teammates well, and it applies, it's sport and performance psychology because it applies to athletes, but it also applies in business um, to tactical athletes, which would be like military and police and fire. It also applies to like performing artists. Um, everyone who has something they want to improve essentially can use the skills from uh, sports psychology. So I've heard a lot about like people visualizing before achieving goals. Is that part of sports psychology? Yeah. So we teach, uh, you call it visualization or imagery. Typically we'll call it imagery just because it's more than just what you see. It's like, how will this feel? How will it look like, how will it look? How will it feel? How will it taste? Like, can you imagine the whole experience of like what you want to have happen? And then like mentally rehearse that thing. That sounds a little bit, are you familiar with NLP? I have not studied it. I've just barely heard about it. It seems like they might have taken some stuff from sports psychology because there's practices where they get you to like, what will you see? What will you feel? What will you hear? And then having you like visualize that. Probably, or maybe I think a lot of uh, the sports psychology world overlaps with personal development. Mm -hmm. Um, it's almost like the sports psych world is very like, it has to be science and it has to be this way. And it's kind of like cold and impersonal. Uh -huh. And then the personal development world is very like, like rah, rah. And like, I want to pump you up and get you excited and make you feel better about yourself, but it's not so grounded, but they both tend to pull similar topics. That makes sense now let's get <laughs> on to the raw raw side can you yeah. give us a description of human design for people who don't know what that is yes so human design is basically like a personality type system but it's based on your time date and place of birth and it just it tells you how you're uniquely wired to operate and thrive in your work your relationships and your life really in any capacity and it just gives us these practical tools to I guess, approach our life in our own unique way and in a way that is more easeful and gives more flow 
than like trying to copy everyone else. Well, that's what's so interesting about meeting you and having you give me some readings because as a projector for anyone that doesn't know in human design projectors, like a teacher type, someone that can see things differently. Mm -hmm. And the fact that you're taking all of your knowledge of other things as a way to teach human design is really interesting. Yeah. I think it's fun to take different modalities. Um, like we were talking about earlier, there's just some things that each modality doesn't necessarily cover because we're very multifaceted human beings and they all have their own approach. So it's nice to be able to integrate other things. Absolutely. I know you're also into manifestation <laughs> since that's how we met at a manifestation <laughs> group. Would you describe yourself as like a really woo woo person? Because coming from your background, it sounds very like science based. You know, I've had a lot of mental blocks around this because <laughs> I totally feel like I'm like not sciencey enough for the sports side, like science people, and I'm not woo woo enough for the woo woo people. But um, I don't know. I think I think I'm pretty woo woo. I I do some of the mystical scientific or scientific the mystical spiritual practices and um, but yeah, I, I like to stay grounded in the science side too. I think they both have a place. How did you come to know that like this was what you wanted to do with your life? Like. Yeah. How did that come about? You mean like human, like combining it and coaching and all of it? Yeah. Like coaching, like you're going to school for this and then yeah. to bring in this like woo woo modality. <laughs> well, and I love it. Was woo -woo. Hard. Uh, I, I say woo woo too when I'm talking to people, but I actually don't think it's very woo woo. Was the, did you have any sort of spiritual awakening or something that happened that made you realize that you were here to like teach something sciencey with something quote unquote woo woo? I don't know what triggered like the combo for me and like the knowing that that was my like purpose, I guess. But I did around my Saturn return, I started getting more into spiritual stuff as one does <laughs> <laughs> and came to like a fully new realization about, you know, who I was and what I wanted to do. And I think that was about the time I really realized that like what was missing from sports psychology for me, like I wanted things to be more personal and I was just on my own spiritual growth journey. And I, I really felt like it had been so important to me. Um, I don't, I don't know that there was like a moment, but definitely my own spiritual journey led me to be like, I, I felt like I was doing a disservice to clients by not offering the insights of human design because I thought they might think it was too woo woo. Like, I, I just felt like, oh, I, if I just talk about sports psychology, I'm actually not helping them in the way I feel like I really could. That is so amazing because human design kind of tells us that like we learn differently or different things apply to how we should live our lives. Yes. I didn't know you were coaching based on that, like before the human design, before bringing it together. So that's so interesting. Yeah, I, I thought about, you know, I apply, I apply everything to my own life too. I'm like my own guinea pig. So I'm like, oh, well, people are meant to set goals differently. But in sports psychology, it would be like, you know, do these three steps. Well, human design would say, maybe you need to approach this a little bit differently. Maybe some people need to be a little more logical or a little more, um, I guess, hardcore and focused. And other people need to be more like feely and flowy and... Mm -hmm into like how the thing feels versus the I guess so it's like qualitative versus quantitative how does it feel versus like rigid um goal setting and sports psychology doesn't give the wiggle room for that did you find that your clients were having more success once you brought the human design aspect into it you know, I kind of hard transitioned into, I lead, well, you know, cause we do this together. I, I lead with human design. Yeah. I, I really keep the sports psych in the back pocket to pull out when there is something somebody wants to work on or focus on. And I feel like the tools, the, we would call them mental skills, but the mental skills from the sports psych would help them in making the changes in their life to become more aligned with their human design but I fully switched and I lead from the human design perspective now. That's what you really helped me with today because we've been working on as a generator. I need to 
do what lights me up. And I was telling you that I was doing what lights me up. And then I was having all my ego was coming in and it was feeling like I was being told not to do what I wanted to. And then when I did it, it was good. But I like how you reframe that as like, it's probably like a pattern, which human design doesn't really talk about patterns. It talks about how we're supposed to engage with the world, but then we, we become conditioned. Can you tell us a little bit more about how we come into the world and we're conditioned to be a certain way? For sure. Um, I think that's the coolest part, right? So human design is like the energy you came in with. And I know you said, and you believe like we chose that Mm -hmm. before coming here, but human design is this energetic blueprint. We'll call it that you come in with having, and it's the ways that are most aligned for you to to approach life. I would say human design is the how it's not the what, um, you could use your design and be an artist or an astronaut or a baker. It's just how, like how you approach the role or the things you do. Um, but conditioning is where we got drawn off track, where we got pulled away from that energetic blueprint. Maybe it was our, the way our parents parented us or their expectations of us or society's expectations. It also could be trauma or whatever other influences we had primarily up until we were seven that um, conditioned us to be a certain way. And that way was not necessarily aligned with our design. That is so true because the more when I started studying human design, I feel like the things that are true about me, like there's a part of me that's like, of course, that's me. But, and it's like refreshing, but I haven't been living like that because it it hadn't felt safe to do Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. I feel like we have a a, a couple different responses when we find out our chart. Some of it is like, so like relieving where you're like, oh my gosh, that's totally me. And I can be that way. And I love that. Or or that feels so good to be seen and Mm -hmm. recognize this thing in me. Or we can be like, oh, no, I don't, that's not me. I don't do things like that. That's not it. And you could tell that, you could say that's conditioning. Um, I don't think people should force themselves to align with their design if it feels wrong. But typically, it's either that feels so good, or it's like, ooh, I always wanted to be that way, or Uh I really would have loved to do that thing, but I didn't because it didn't feel safe, or that wasn't allowed in my house, or... I don't feel like, um, like I would feel lazy or I would feel, uh, like unproductive or like I was doing something wrong if I actually aligned with this piece, because that's not how I'm supposed to do it. That's the most conditioning I have being a generator is like, I love to do work that I love. Like I could go all day, but it's like, it feels like it's like cheating, when you're doing something like if I'm on set and it's so amazing and like oh I'm getting paid to do this but it feels like well this isn't fair but that's like the mm-hmm. conditioning of the world's like shouldn't we do what we love it, right it's like where did we get this idea that it's that we should like be on earth and be like struggling and be unhappy I don't know where it came from but I don't like it <laughs> <laughs> But it's true. And I think if more people were, you know, generators were lit up by what they were doing, or people were living more alignment with their design, people would be generally happier. They'd be spending their time in the way they want to. They'd be facing less resistance and stress in their lives. And it would make everybody, everyone like, I think their design helps them step into like the purpose they have for being here. Ooh. Yeah. So that, that begs another question that we were talking about earlier. Cause I think that like, we like, do you think that we like decided our chart? What are, what are your spiritual beliefs? Like that we like chose everything about who we're going to be? You know, I don't know. I've never actually considered how, I guess, specific we chose, Mm -hmm. like did it, does like the higher self or the spiritual self get to decide every nitty gritty thing? Or is there just some overall lessons we're supposed to have and we came in at a time that would like give us those influences? Mm -hmm. I don't know. I I do think we definitely chose when to come and we knew lessons we were coming in to learn. It's almost like we could have been sitting with our spirit guides and we were like, okay, I want to work on these things. And they put it in a computer. So they're like, okay, so this is a chart you're going to have so that you could learn those (laughs) lessons. 
I know. I'm like, I don't, I don't know how this works, how specific, but I guess, yeah, I think that we purposely came in with the chart we came in with and the lessons we were meant to learn. I love that. So do you feel like there was a point where you had a spiritual awakening or were you always kind of interested in this sort of thing? No, definitely spiritual awakening. I, I think I was always fascinated by like horoscopes and stuff as a kid, but I never took too much stock in them. I never dove in. It's like, I knew I was an Aquarius, but that was about it. (laughs) And then again, this, the Saturn return time, I was diving into personal growth and spiritual growth. And I, I found it was like a rabbit hole. I, I just like found astrology. I didn't really resonate with it. And will fall fully down the hole. I know like my own a little bit. And then I found like Dr. Joe Dispenza and I started meditating and I found TBM and I just felt like my personal growth and spiritual growth started happening all really fast and at the same time around that Saturn return period. Mm-hmm. Uh, also when I was getting divorced, so I was like refinding myself, I guess you could say. And so no, that was definitely, I would say like a year or two period where I started diving into the more spiritual stuff. Did you know you were going through your Saturn return? Because when I went through mine, if I had known, I feel like (laughs) I would have like learned so much, but instead I was just like, what the fuck is going on? (laughs) No, I do believe I knew. I, I want to say I started diving into everything spiritual more towards the beginning of it. And that had come up. So it like cause so you were because I found out about it later and I'm like, oh my God, that's what was happening. Yeah. Like, so that that's good. Yeah. My my first session with an astrologer, uh, she was like, Yeah, you're set, like you're done. Yours is over. Um, and I was like, okay, perfect. Like I knew I was in it and I I'm not still I'm not a s I'm not an astrologer. I yeah. don't know like the degrees at which people like say stuff starts and ends. And so I was like am I still having to live this Saturn return? Like I'm so over this like tumultuous stuff. And she's like, no, even though we're about to retrograde, it's not going to like hit your chart again. I'm like, okay, thank God. I'm so over it. so good. Have you had any weird like mystical spiritual things happen? Not sober. (laughs) Like on (laughs) mushrooms or? Yeah. Yeah. Comfortable. I don't know if you're comfortable talking about that. If you're not, it's totally fine. Yeah, uh, that's fine. I, um, so I, I typically just microdose and enjoy like meditations and stuff when I am doing mushrooms, but I did do a really heavy dose one time. I don't remember how heavy enough that I saw things and went somewhere else. And, um, Mm. I actually got to talk to my dad and he's passed. So, and he had passed during my Saturn return or right before it. So yeah, my Saturn return was like divorce, dad dying, like all all the things. And I did this journey, I think it was a couple years after he had passed. And there was just some unfinished things I was never, I thought never going to get closure on. Yeah. Yeah. And so we got to kind of, I would say, talk it out. If you've done mushrooms, you know, it's not like a real conversation-ish, but the energy of it was closure. And I also, there was like tests involved. Like, I feel like I was like walking down this path as my, the the journey started and Mm. I was like tested by, I don't know, entities. And then as I like passed tests, this is my, I guess, experience of it as I passed tests. And then I finally got like presented with him and I don't know, it was just, I cried for like six hours, but like the most cathartic and amazingly like, I don't know, loving closure experience. Oh my God. That's so beautiful. Yeah. What do you mean? I, the first time I took ayahuasca, I felt like I was tested by the devil. Did you mean you had to like energetically tested or so in boundaries, uh, specifically, oh. I had been seeing somebody and their uh, sister had passed and was no longer around. And um, the journey was basically like, it was like her testing me about him. It was like, it was very like, she was presenting as this like dark side and entity. So you said the devil, but like, it was actually like, uh, like demented clowns, like, like, 
put jack what do you call those like the ones that pop up it was oh, like jack the, in the box like yes like jack in the box clowns but like in a scary fun house type of scenario oh that God. i was like walking through and i just kept repeating my boundaries like i said only things that are for my highest good like i said no i said this and i was like you know i'm like i'm so fucked right now <laughs> like how do i how do i leave this crazy fun house that i'm trapped in and so I just kept on like, no, like you are allowed to have your own boundaries. And you said no. So I just kept saying, I said, no, I said, no. And she kept being like, are you sure? Are you sure you're not tempted? Are you sure you're this? Like, are you sure you have strong enough boundaries? Like it was just like testing of how, how strong I felt like my spiritual boundaries were. And Ooh. yeah, <laughs> it was wild. That aligns so much with TBM. We're talking about to be magnetic, which is uh, <laughs> Lacey Phillips work about manifestation. Like the word, like when the universe quote unquote tests you, yeah. but like, that's so amazing that that happened like on a psychedelic experience, like yes. your spiritual bounty. So maybe if you hadn't passed those tests, you would not have gotten to talk to your dad and had that closure. Yeah. Who knows? I don't know, but that's how it played out. And then I'm guessing the relationship with the guy was done after this. <laughs> you're like your sister's crazy. No, I'm just kidding. I, uh, no, it wasn't actually, we maintained a really good friendship for a long time, but, uh, I'm like, he doesn't know this story. So that's, uh, yeah. Wow. Well, he does now. <laughs> so talking about spiritual boundaries. So, yeah. and like energetic hygiene, what, Ooh. what do you, what do you recommend to be? I mean, I know it's like you can sage in Palo Santo and who knows how much that really does without the right intention and other things. What, what do you do to keep like spiritual boundaries or to keep your energetic hygiene? You know, mine It's funny. I don't know if, you know, like chicken or the egg stuff. Like, I don't know if this comes from my background in sports psychology <laughs> or if like, I'm always already like this and that's part of what attracted me to it. But I feel like it's a lot of my self-talk. I, I, same thing as like this uh spiritual experience i say things in my mind over and over so it's like i don't know if you want to call it quite chanting but i like verbally say whatever the boundary is in my mind and depending on what it is right like if i'm around somebody who i think has really bad energy but maybe i can't leave mm -hmm. in my mind i am like you know you don't have permission to enter my space and like you know please or like prayers of protection and I'll visually I'll visualize myself with like a bubble around me sort of I love that yeah <laughs> I was listening to a podcast yesterday where a guy was saying he felt violated because this woman he was on a zoom with was trying to read his energy and he hadn't given her permission and that's kind of like the opposite like that's kind of like what you're saying is like you do not have permission to get inside my energetic mm -hmm. vortex. Yes. I actually had a really woo woo experience recently where this person was around multiple times and feels like she's has other entities inside of her. We'll say it like that. Like I've never been around a human before where I was like, you, something is like, something is inside. Like you're not fully human. Something is off with you. I don't know if it's possession. I don't mm -hmm. know. People have lots of different words for that. Those, this is the only person I've ever felt this around. Mm. And it, I like so strongly had to sit there and be like, you do not have permission to enter my body. Like you need to leave this space like over and over and over and over again until they were no longer in my space. This was a stranger. This wasn't like someone you were around. This is someone at my job. Oh, so you felt this like you feel this all the time around this person. Yes. Oh my God. But I don't have to frequently interact with them. But yeah. when I did, I was like, oh my gosh, like something is super off here. It like, yeah. set off all those alarm bells. And yeah, those spiritual boundaries, just like on repetition, somewhere between, you know, a, an affirmation and a prayer, I guess. And on top of the visualization of like the bubble, like the impenetrable bubble. That is so powerful. So this actually ties back into human design because in a, in a 
roundabout way. So for anyone that doesn't know, the areas in your chart that are opened or they're white, you absorb and amplify energy from others. Do you feel that that's the same as like a negative energy or that's just like people's emotions and... I don't feel like human design was speaking about entities in the way that I was just <laughs> talking about. Yeah. But definitely energy, emotions, thoughts, fears, stress. I know those were some of the things we talked about today, talking about centers too, that we pick up where we're open in our chart, we pick up on and can amplify other people's stuff. Do you think we're we would be able to say... Do you think we would be able to block ourselves off from that? Or do you think part of the human experience with the open centers is that we're meant to experience that? Maybe a little of both. Maybe there's people who have enough boundaries and are trying to ward off from that. But I do think it's part of the human experience that we're meant to have those interactions. And that like, that's why reflectors are the way they are. Like we're meant to kind of sample those things and feel those things in other people. And that's where we're learning our lessons. So I think we're supposed to. Also on blocking it out, I almost feel like you would have to walk like almost like, like with a hoodie on and sunglasses on, like spiritually, you'd be like, ah, oh, don't look at me. Don't talk to me. Don't interact with me. Don't influence me. Don't. I feel like you'd have to kind of walk around like that in order to not experience it. Yeah. Would you... Would you give us just a brief like introduction of each of the types, like a couple sentences for anyone that is not clear? I'm I, I'm like, oh, everyone knows human design types, but that's just because I'm obsessed with it. <laughs> I know. I get the same way too. I'm like, what do you mean? So yeah, there's five types in human design. Type in human design is sort of like your sun sign in astrology, where it's if someone asks you what your design is, that's typically what they're referring to unless they're a nerd like us and they want to give all the pieces <laughs> up front. So it's just the first piece, but there's lots of layers underneath. Type is how you best use your energy. And so we have generators who have this like big juicy energy, this creative energy when they're lit up by what they're doing mm -hmm. and manifesting generators are similar. They still have that big juicy energy when they're lit up by what they're doing, but they also tend to move fast and kind of move on from thing to thing. Um, where generators typically will do things more step by step. Manifestors are the ones who are here to like spark the fire. They have this like creative energy where it's not that they do the thing so much like generators. It's where they have the idea. They have this creative idea, this disruptive idea. They can tend to be a little, uh, I guess, confrontational or a little disruptive because they like have this idea of the, a way to change things but they're not necessarily meant to follow through. Projectors are here to like lead and guide and teach. And reflectors are here to reflect back to the community, kind of the state of the community. So in a flow, I see that as like, manifestors have the spark for this idea. Generators and manifesting generators tend to that spark and they make it bigger. They grow the fire, they fan the flames. Projectors might give some feedback on how to do that a little more efficiently. And then the reflector is there like at the campfire, just like reflecting back the state of that whole tribe. Ooh, so it's like how we all work together on the planet. Mm -hmm. So how do you think that people learning about their human design type can like change their life in a positive manner? Yeah. Ugh. So many ways. I, I like, I, I always say, Oh, I love this. This is my favorite part, but it says it's all my favorite. <laughs> I really think it's uh, great for personal growth and development. It's great for like building your own confidence and reducing resistance. I know a lot of the personal growth world talks about like, go find this person who has the thing you want or did the thing you want to do and do it exactly like they did it. So you can have the same result. And anyone who's like me totally burnt out trying that because mm -hmm. their way was not meant for me. And it was just like resistance after resistance after resistance. Like when you have your human design, it's how you can do the things in a way that is more easeful and more full of flow. And it just aligns better. It's not perfect. It doesn't take away, I think, like your human experience, but it definitely reduces resistance in the things that you do. 
I also think in relationships, it's really important because we get this sense of understanding of ourselves and also how we're different from our partners or our friends or our coworkers or whoever it is that we're relating to. And it gives us a little more compassion for how people do things differently than us. Oh, yeah, that's so true. I think it like helps you accept other people and also know how to love them better. Yes. Yeah. It's like love languages on steroids, kind of. Have you done, so I know you said you were interested in like all the other things. Are you into like Enneagram and? I have dabbled in all of them or a lot of them. But do you like human design because it's like, it is what it is and it never changes. Like you're always this. Yeah. With, so with human design, you're not taking a quiz. You're not answering questions. It's just like time, date, and place of birth. That doesn't ever change. Yeah. With Enneagram or Myers-Briggs or those things, you're take love languages. You're taking a quiz at a certain point in time and a certain mindset that potentially your answers change over time or you're answering the way you think you want to answer. Totally. There's a lot of like dancing around how you answer those questions. And I like that this just is what it is. And it's not, it could, it's not going to change. And isn't it true that like, so there's five different energy types, but there's so much in a chart that like, we're all so unique that I'm sure you've seen that looking at hundreds of thousands of charts that there's just like so much nuance in everyone's chart and yeah, I mean, you would have to basically be identical twins or born at the exact same time to have the same chart. And even then, you get conditioned differently. And you have different oh. passions and you have different things. So even with the same chart, the approach could be different. Like maybe the one's open head got way more conditions than one's open solar plexus or something. So even with the exact same chart, which is, again, rare, it's like twins. Yeah. You have some different things to work with. And can you, you said something really cool about how there's like a channel that I have that connected with yours that you're able <laughs> yeah. to like express something. Yes. Can you explain how like when we're around certain people, our charts, like they don't become different, but they. Yeah. I mean, there are like layered charts where you like layer chart over another. I don't typically do those readings, but I mean, this whole thing is about energy, energy and what you bring to the table and what other people bring to the table and, you know, how those work together. What you're talking about is uh, we both have split definition, which I guess a brief overview of that definition is how your chart connects and it's how you process information and like relate to the people around you with split definition. That means somewhere in our chart, there's a gap that like wants to meet. And mm. that's why it feels good sometimes. And we feel more creative if we're in a coffee shop or we're around people because they give a little bit of that energy to, and potentially somebody there has that gap. You fill that gap for me. So something in your chart bridges my gap and it makes my whole chart flow better. And more specifically, it's from the mind to the throat for me. So you have the whole channel actually, and I just have half of it. So when I'm with you, I feel like my thoughts from my mind actually come out of my mouth way better. I should just be <laughs> next to you on all your, yes. your coaching calls. Yes. <laughs> this just made me realize something that I didn't even realize because I invited you to be on the podcast. Yep. And I I feel like on TikTok, I get a lot of questions about projectors and like I've studied human design, but I'm not a projector. So the way I explain it is different than you. Can you explain how for projectors, I'm thinking of one friend in particular, how you're supposed to wait for an invitation, but it's like, what are, like, I invited you to be on this because I found out you're a human design reader. I loved once I got to work with you, but how do you get those invitations? Like, how do you manifest that as a projector? Totally. I think that's one of the biggest issues people have when they first get into human design, by the way, is their strategy. They, mm -hmm. a lot of them seem very passive. Like they almost sound like, oh, you just, I just have to sit around and wait. Yes. And so for me as a projector, wait for the invitation. And I felt the same way. I'm like, how, what do you mean? I just sit at home and someone's going to call. Like, how does that work? And it's not like that at all. It's 
if the invitation is really only needed when you're going to be giving insights or sharing your gifts or something like that. Okay. So it doesn't have to be for everything, but so how do you get those invitations? You put yourself out there. So I, the way I see it is you let's talk social media, my Instagram page. If I, if someone's following me in my mind, they've invited me to share because they opted in to see what I have to say. Oh. So I'm not seeking them out. I'm not sending them DMS. I'm not like, Hey, can I, but they opted in to see what I have to say. And so they can invite me from there. The big thing for projectors is to like make themselves seen and known for whatever it is that they're gifted at. We're gifted at teaching and guiding, but all in different contexts. So putting ourselves out there in a way that lets people see us so they can invite us. The other way also I see too, like if I want to get on podcasts, if someone has, if like you had, say you had put a post out that was said, Hey, I'm looking for podcast guests. I can take that as an invitation. You okay. said you're looking for it. You didn't ask me specifically. So it might not be as like, I guess, deep or connective, but the offer was there. Because you saw it, it was in your world. Yeah. And you were asking, right? I mean, you were inviting people to apply or to be on your podcast. It wasn't yes. a, an invitation necessarily, again, directed at me, but it was an invitation. There's some nuance there. Um the reason for it is, right, we don't have the energy. We don't have all this energy to use all the time. So we want to be very diligent about using it in the right spaces at the right times so we don't get bitter. Because if I'm trying to give you advice that you didn't ask for, I'm going to get bitter because I just wasted my energy. Yes. And you're going to be annoyed that I'm like telling you what to do and giving you unsolicited advice. So waiting for the invitation is simply a way of energetically knowing that like there's a place for your guidance to land and that it's wanted. I love that. Okay. So I was only going to ask about projectors, but because you <laughs> described that so beautifully, now the other types need this same wisdom because okay. as a generator and manifesting generators, we're not waiting, but we are waiting to respond. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. And so same thing, it's not passive. It's not like sit at home and see if something like what walks into your house for you to respond to. <laughs> you know, it's so like, it's, it, it sounds silly when you make fun of it a little bit like that, but that's how it feels when you first learn your design. So, yeah. Um, it, for generators and manifesting generators, you are meant to respond to things and not just go initiate. Mm -hmm. But that response can be to something you heard on a podcast or something you that was said in a conversation with a friend. Maybe you're in a coffee shop and you overhear something. Anything that's around you can spark you to respond to it. So put yourself, again, go, go be out and about. Go create opportunities for things to respond to. So like if I'm at a coffee shop and I hear like start a YouTube channel, which I already have, but if I didn't, <laughs> that could be, if I was lit up by that, that's, that's responding. A hundred percent. Okay. And manifestors, they have, they seem like they have the easy one. <laughs> yeah. So they are meant to just initiate essentially like they can just start stuff. I think their, their job really is more on the, they're a lot opposite in a lot of ways they're meant to just start things but they have to take the pressure off themselves to finish it they don't have to finish it oh right because they just initiate and then generators are or if a projector feels invited they're like oh this is like yeah inspiring me or whatever and then they go help yeah so the the manifester can have the creative spark they just have to know that they're not the one necessarily meant to do all the doing okay and so like reflectors, they're supposed to wait like a 28 lunar day cycle, right? To, I guess, get the answer to something in their mm -hmm. life. Yeah. If they're trying to make a big decision, they're meant to wait a lunar cycle. It's not always practical. Yeah. Uh, the essence of that is to feel out their decisions in different spaces and with different people and feel it out over time. Oh, that's so interesting. Yeah. 
Are there any like practical, easy sports psychology type tips we can offer anyone that wants to improve their life? Like, what would you recommend? Visualize. You know, I'm like, I, I'm, I'm hesitant to give anything out generic like that. Cause okay. that's exactly why I dove into human design was to Got not it. give generic advice. I mean, find what works for you. Human design is called the human design experiment. Experiment with stuff. Does yeah. visualizing work for you? That, but yeah, I don't, I don't want to give generalized advice because it's so different for everyone. That's what I love about you is your, I feel like we're all so different and that's how we achieve our dreams differently. We have our spiritual awakenings differently. We're meant to go about life differently. So what is your Instagram handle and everything? And I'll link everything in the show notes. Yeah. So Instagram is just my name. It's crystal.holberg. That's K-R-Y-S-T-A-L dot K-O-H-L-B-E-R-G. And then my website will be, um, it's Monroe Musings. It's my company. So M-U-N-R-O. M-U-S-I-N-G-S dot com. And can you please share the offering that you are taking me through right now? What the, the, it's like a find my flow. It, it's been so powerful and we're only like halfway yeah. through. Yes. So it's a five session series going through your chart and it's called find your flow. So it's help to help you, you know, reduce resistance in your life and find your flow and find the way to, I guess, bring more ease into your life in whatever area or all the areas you want to focus on. I found it so helpful because I've studied a lot of human design, but for one thing, having someone else, a projector, explain it to me. And I like the way how you break it down first with like type and then strategy. And then like each week, it's been a different focus. So each week after we meet, I'm able to like go into my regular life and apply one specific area of the chart. And you know, I've already had a couple breakthroughs. So thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. So thank you so much for being on the podcast. It has been a joy. This one is so interesting. I feel like I learned so much. Is there anything else you want to share with our listeners? No, just thank you. Thank you for inviting me to be here. And <laughs> I enjoy it so much. I can't wait to clip out. I mean, I'm going to do a bunch of clips, but especially that projector part. I'm like, oh, the projectors need to hear this. So thank you so much. <laughs> Have a beautiful week. Thanks, you too. Thanks to all the listeners. Have a wonderful week and thanks for taking this ride with us.